some of you may think that numbers are boring. Admit it. I'm not here to tell you that you're wrong. But I am here to tell you that numbers are an issue of power and of justice. But this particular story starts with some noodles. Nearly six years ago, my friend Paul Ladd and I were sitting in Tokyo in a noodle bar, just restoring ourselves after a long day of meetings with the UN and governments. We'd spent the day in a windowless room, as I recall, talking about what people around the world really wanted. And as we sat there, we wondered whether we were getting it right. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if, instead of all of us trying to guess what people around the world wanted, we could just ask them instead? And wouldn't it be even better if we could take those answers and take them to the politicians and the UN officials and the others who make decisions on those people's behalf? Well, we couldn't invite the whole world to share our noodles, but we did find the answer to those questions using numbers. Because that conversation led directly to us creating the My World Survey with our friend Corinne Woods and some other amazing people in the United Nations. And with a thousand organizations all over the world, we took the survey to some of the remote, most remote places, to women farming cassava in the far north of Nigeria, to rubbish pickers on the streets of India, to Boy Scouts in far-flung islands of the Philippines, and students the length and breadth of Mexico. By 2015, nearly 10 million people, that's one in every 700 of us on this earth, had answered one simple question about what they most wanted for themselves and their families. And together, we crunched the numbers, and we took the data and the people's voices and their stories inside it right into the heart of politics. And what we found was that as well as good health, an education, a good job, one of the things that people around the world wanted, millions of people, was a government that they could trust and that would respond to their needs. And we took this message into the UN. And that's why, as the UN was agreeing the Sustainable Development Goals in 2014, 2015, despite the fact that many governments didn't really want a goal that would actually relate to them and hold them to account, we do have a sustainable development goal that is about governments, that is about good institutions, and about justice between people and governments. Because those millions of people in the numbers couldn't be ignored. Data, numbers, can give people power, even inside the labyrinths of the UN politics. And sometimes data can create action even when pictures, even when words have failed. I'm taking you back over 100 years now to the end of the Industrial Revolution in the UK. And the extent of poverty in cities around the country was known. There were pictures, photographs like this, there were words, but nothing was being done. But in 1899, as the government, as, the, as Britain was fighting a war in Southern Africa, the government started to call up young men from around the country to fight in the army. And the data that they found as a result of that call-up shocked them. In some cities, nine out of 10 young men were unable to join the army because they were simply too sick. And it was this data and the blow to national pride and the fear for Britain's security which started the political process and led, many years later, the, to the creation of the National Health Service, which is celebrating its 70th anniversary this year and still, some people say, the closest thing that my country has to a national religion. Data, being in the numbers that tell the story of their societies, gives people power. As you reflect on that, Let's just think for a minute, then, about the injustice of all the people who are not in the data. I lived for a year in an invisible place among invisible people. 
This white line is a road in the far north of Mozambique. Somewhere on that line is a village called Nakuka. It's a village like tens of thousands of others across the continent of Africa. Early this morning, the adults rose at dawn and went out into the cotton fields. Probably right now, boys are kicking up a dust storm with playing football with balls made out of rags. And all day, the village has moved to the rhythm of women with babies on their backs, pounding the maize to make the flour that's the staple diet. But as you can see, the village, so full of life, is invisible, it's not on the map. And the people who lived there were invisible too. This is Elsa, the granddaughter of the family that I live with. Clearly she's not invisible, she's in fact adorable. But Elsa and over half of the children who are born today in Mozambique are not registered at birth. The government doesn't know they exist. Millions and millions of people around the world are not registered. Their lives, their deaths are not counted. If they get sick, nobody knows. If when they die, they're not in the records. And their fields and their houses are not on any register. They're uncounted and they're invisible to the governments and others that should be looking after them. This really matters. Because if you believe, as I do, that every life counts, you can't do very much about it unless every life is counted. The children in the village of Nakuka, many of them didn't go to school. And in that, they were alike about 264 million children in the world today who are also not in school. This is a huge and frightening number, and quite rightly, many people are trying to do something about it. But because those children are not in the numbers, it's very difficult to know what to do to help. We need to know how many, how many children are at school because there isn't a school or a teacher near where they live. How many children are not at school because they're looking after a brother, a sister, a parent? How many children are not in school because they're too sick or they have a disability that prevents them from going to school? How many children, tragically, are not in school because they're simply ashamed of their ragged clothes or their lack of equipment? and they can't face their peers. We need to know the answers to those questions before we know how to spend the millions of dollars that people are spending around the world to try to change this sorry figure and give all of those children an opportunity to learn. But because we don't have the numbers, we're risking, frankly, a horrible waste of money because there's a danger that we're spending it on the wrong things because those children and not in the numbers. In some places, invisibility can be a matter of life and death. Just imagine a disaster strikes, an earthquake, a flood, an epidemic. The health workers come with medicines, with vaccines, emergency workers with blankets, with tents, with food. But if you don't know where the villages are, and if you don't know how many people live in them, and if you don't know how many children, how many pregnant women there are, how do you know where to go? And how do you know what help to take? Lack of data, not having the people in the numbers to make saving lives take longer and ultimately costs lives in those, drast those terrible situations. Lack of data can kill. And because a poor person in a poor country is the most invisible person that there is, Lack of data is an issue of global justice. People can be invisible for many reasons. Sometimes it's simply because governments haven't invested in the data. They don't have the resources. They've been trying to do other things. The good news here is that it is getting easier and cheaper to make people visible in the data. This is a large part of what I do every day, running the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development data. We work with surveys and censuses, with the trusty workhorses, the backbone of any good data system, and also with some of the new technologies, with the images from the satellites that are flying overhead every minute, from the mobile phones that we all carry in our pockets, from all of the information that's available on the web, 
And by putting these things together, we can make more people visible than ever before. Now, when an earthquake hits, a government can reach out for the satellite imagery that can show what's happened to people. And hundreds of volunteers are ready to analyze that data and to show governments where help is needed. In Ghana, we're working with Vodafone and with the government of Ghana, helping to understand how people are moving around the country thanks to mobile phone records that will mean that when the next epidemic strikes, they're ready to take the medicines to where they're going to be needed. And satellites and surveys put together can tell us who lives in some of the places that have, have, where people have been invisible for decades because of conflict. <laughs> Afghanistan is a country that hasn't had a census since 1979. And to give you a sense of how long ago that was, this is what women were wearing on the streets of Afghanistan that year. These women's children, maybe even their grandchildren, have never been counted. We don't know who they are, we don't know where they live. And Af as, as, the, as the government of Afghanistan tries to rebuild a modern state and give people the services they need, not knowing who is there is the most basic problem that a government can face. But thanks to, thanks to the government of Afghanistan, thanks to donors, thanks to many partners, they're putting satellites and surveys together and finding out who lives in that country to give them the possibility to give people the services that they need. We can end the injustice of invisibility. Now, we know how to do it. And the good news is that in the scale of the development problems that we face, it's actually quite cheap to fix. It would cost maybe a tenth of what it would cost to eradicate malaria worldwide. Of course, there are other reasons why people are invisible, and those are not quite so easy to solve. Sometimes governments want to keep people invisible. They don't want to confront the reality of some of the problems that people face in their country, the ethnicities, the disabilities. They don't want to solve the problems of their people. Sometimes people want to stay hidden because they don't trust the government. They don't want to be in the data because they fear what that kind of visibility that they bring. And of course, the irony is that the very same technologies that bring us these possibilities for better data are the same technologies that are causing so many of us worldwide to lose our faith in data. It's not surprising sometimes when you think every day brings another story of someone selling, stealing, scamming. We've stopped trusting the custodians of our data and sometimes we've even stopped trusting the data itself. But what's the alternative? Data is the lifeblood of policy making. If people stay hidden, if governments choose to make them, make them hidden, if we stop using evidence to make decisions, what's the alternative? We make decisions based on guesswork, blind faith, prejudice. None of these, I think, are worlds that we want to live in. This is a problem that you can't fix with technology. You can only fix it by talking by showing what's possible, by building trust. We have to show that it matters, that it's better to be in the data than out, and that it's better to use data to make decisions than to rely on simply guesswork. And that's why what a lot of what we do day to day in my organization is not about cool innovations and gadgets and new platforms, much though I love that stuff. But it's actually about building trust. It's about building communities. It's about building the institutions that will create the kind of data system that people want to be in, that governments that will want to use, and that will make the world a better place for all of us. Data is fundamentally about people. If you care about people, you should care about data. Now, I'm the first to admit that date numbers data doesn't always inspire passion. Sometimes it's the boring bit that we skip over to get to the actual story. Let's all admit it. But please just sometimes don't. Because with millions of people not in the numbers, not counted, not registered, not mapped, these are the people that have no power and they get no help. Our collective shrug about data is killing people. So next time, 
please start asking about the numbers, about the people that you care about, about your own communities, about your countries, about people living far away whose stories touch you. Ask for the numbers and don't let anyone, not governments, not the UN, not charities, get away with not telling you. Because not counting people means taking away their power and denying them justice. We can, so please can we, do better than that. Thank you. <laughs>